Hey everybody, Stephen Kastik from GrappleArts.com. Today I am interviewing my friend, Zen master, <laughs> urban combatives expert, <laughs> Maharishi, cult leader, and most importantly, Jiu Jitsu black belt, Robert Naki. So, welcome to Grapple Arts. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephen. And only a few of those things were true. But, uh, I'll, I'll, maybe by the end of the, uh, the discussion, you guys will be able to figure out what it is. But I guess it ties in with the whole. Uh, Discussion of jiu-jitsu guys being all jiu-jitsu guys. Anybody who does this sport is a little bit weird, right? Like I don't Agreed. think I don't think it attracts a normal cross section of, of people. Definitely not. Uh, I think that to have the sort of demeanor and state of mind that allows you to willingly roll around on the floor with sweaty men. Wearing pajamas. Wearing pajamas and sometimes wearing spandex. Spandex, exactly. Uh, something that resembles a, a ballet outfit more than anything else. <laughs> Definitely doesn't lead to a, a profile of the population that's, yeah. that we would call normal. Well, and then, I mean, of course, so you've got all of us, us relatively normal jiu-jitsu people, because... We think of ourselves yeah, as normal, yeah. but... But then you've got some crazy-ass outliers out there, too. I mean, we were just also talking about the Paul Harris, the Paul uh, Harris shield, shield, shield fight. Yeah. Paul Harris is not normal. He's fantastic to watch. He's very... I don't leave the room when he's fighting. Well, he's a savant, I think, is the, the, the term. He has a, a particular ability with jiu-jitsu that is probably unrivaled. The, the old term would have been idiot savant? It's idiot savant, yes, I because know, he's also an idiot, is the good way of putting it. Autistic savant is the new... Is the new, of, yeah, the, the, the polite way okay, well, what of... Do you mean, what do you mean by that? What do you mean that he's a savant? The, in that he has an ability uh, that far excels any other field or, or endeavor that he's able to, to create excellence and I think that this is that he is uniquely suited to be good at twisting human limbs okay and that's it I, I, I think that if you were, and a couple of months ago I would have said leg locks in particular leg locks but, in, but I think it's a general yeah, yeah I, I, it is, I mean he's obviously a physical freak whether that is a genetic condition or a pharmaceutical condition I'll leave up to the uh, athletic Commission and their blood test brigade, but or, or the internet forums. Exactly, <laughs> we'll use the eye test and swear yeah. up and down that they're correct no matter what. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I think there are people in society, and, and I, I mean, I think I can uh, hopefully, with a little bit of self-reflection, categorize myself as a little bit this. Where I've focused so narrowly on creating a skill set and a knowledge base that although I, I do have a fair bit of knowledge in different subjects, all of them I've pursued to suit my ability to, to teach or understand jiu-jitsu better to the point where there are likely social graces that I'm probably missing. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say probably, uh, definitely missing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know I've, uh, for instance, in, in the town that, that I have a school, I've walked up to people and straight up asked them, like, why aren't you training at my club? <laughs> when these are people who claim to be really into jiu-jitsu and yet they're training with somebody who is and I mean, if I say they're objectively unqualified, I'm going to sound like a jerk, but I mean, anybody who has followed jiu-jitsu and understands the, the jiu-jitsu rank system and, and how this stuff is done would recognize that someone who has two or three years of training is not particularly qualified to be teaching a lot of people jiu-jitsu unless they're in an area where there is no jiu-jitsu. Mm -hmm. So there's my lack of social graces where I will straight up say to someone, hey, you like jiu-jitsu, right? Why are you training at that crappy club when you could be training mm -hmm. at a good club? Things you're not supposed to that say. Things you're not supposed to say, but I, you know, again, I, I don't ever do it out of malice or disrespect. I do it out of a, a fondness for jiu-jitsu practitioners and wanting to help people who obviously love something do it in a way that is going to enable them to get better at it much quicker. So, what percentage of the really good guys in jiu-jitsu, we're talking yeah. like the world champions, would <laughs> would come out as something like Asperger's? Like clearly they're not, like or just that mono uh, that mono focus. Like, well, I, I, I would do, I would I would say the Meow brothers are uh, a pretty good example of. Yeah, there was that interview where it's like, well, what else do you do besides jiu-jitsu? Do you have any hobbies? <laughs> that was yeah, the, yeah, I mean, I don't think I'd be ruffling any feathers to say that they come off, at the very least come off as pretty yeah. autistic, pretty far on the, on the autism, autism spectrum. scale, on the autism spectrum. And yeah. have achieved some amazing abilities. Ab absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, I, I think that anybody who achieves a level of greatness, and I mean like, world-class level greatness is going to have a little bit of a screw loose. I mean, I, I don't think that's even a jiu-jitsu thing. I think no, that's a sports thing. Steve like, Jobs wasn't a balanced individual. No, it, I mean, the stories you hear about Michael Jordan, you know, the stories you hear about Kobe Bryant where he's, 
he's the guy who shows up at 4 a.m. to shoot baskets. Mm -hmm. That is a, a level of dedication I think most people can't even begin to fathom, mm -hmm. uh, myself included. And I, I think that I dedicated myself quite extensively to my craft, but uh, I don't think I have the capacity or ever did have the capacity to achieve that level of, of athletic prowess. And I mean, if, if I thought I did, I probably would have tried. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, let alone the genetic kind of lottery component where well, your body can sustain that kind of dedication. If motivation is the engine, there are a lot of big engines out there yeah. on, on shitty chassis that just fall apart when they hit the road. And some of that's genetics. Yeah. A lot of that's luck. I mean, out there somewhere, somewhere is some guy who was 10 times better than Marcelo Garcia and was killing everybody and in the first six months of training was better than you know, most people are after five years mm -hmm. and was on his track to becoming world champion and then one day didn't tap and destroyed like his, his knee, or, his knee yeah. or his shoulder or his back. Yeah. back you know, there's surgeries for other things that kind of work. But, yeah. And we never, hear, we never hear from that guy. Yeah, that guy absolutely. is now running a, a car wash somewhere. Well, there's a sort of survivor bias. This really. is a, that I was going to bring up that exact term, it's a survivor bias. Uh, I, I'm guessing you've read uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb's book, The Black Swan, yes, 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 and yes. Fooled by Randomness. Those make that point exactly. Is that you know you, you pick up a book by some by a winner, and he tells you what he did to win, when he's not very likely to recognize that part of what he did to win was be born to two parents that gave him steel cables for tendons, yeah. or that he was fortunate enough to you know, attend an academy where he got this kind of instruction. And I was lucky enough not to get injured. Not to get injured. Or in a major way. Exactly. Uh, and, and those are things, you know, there are, there are, for every one guy who is a billionaire and did steps A, B, C, and D to become a billionaire, <laughs> there's a hundred guys who took steps A, B, C, and D, and they maybe didn't go bankrupt, but they're worth you know half a million dollars and they're relatively successful. But they're doing the exact same damn things yeah. that the billionaire is. And, and it's, again, I, I'm not saying it's it's all luck by by any stretch. Just like you, you could never claim for any athlete that it's uh, you know anything other than an excessive amount of hard work that gets them sure. there. You but need an excessive amount of hard work. Yeah. But then that then, then there's those other yeah. factors, those intangibles that I don't think right. we give enough. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a whole random element in it, which is explored uh, in those books. Yeah. You know, the idea being that if you start out with a thousand stockbrokers, half of them are going to lose money, half of them are going to gain money. So the half of them that lose money get kicked out of the market. Yep. Then I get 500, you know, half of them are going to gain money. Half, yeah. After 10 years, you're going to have some guy who's won 10 years in a row. Yeah. And if you have a, the, the, the right number of stockbrokers doing this year after year, it's inevitable that you end up with Warren Buffett. Yeah. I'm not saying Warren Buffett isn't smart. I don't know enough about that. But it's but the it's, law of large numbers. Exactly. Yeah. But the, then the counter, not the counter, the uh, complementary view, have you read Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers? Outliers, yes, absolutely. Where he talks a lot about the, um, <laughs> you know, for example, I, it's the hockey example, and uh, being a Canadian, I should know this inside out, but I don't. Yeah, if you're born in January or February, yeah. you get the, the, the benefits that come yeah. from being the, a little the cut bit off, larger. The cutoff yeah. is in February, so yeah. any kid born in March is screwed, because they're going to be, you know, six months, eight months, 12 months smaller than the kids at the, at the end of the cohort, and they're going to get a little bit less attention yeah. in the peewee leagues or whatever it is, like, like, like I said, yeah. I'm Canadian. Uh, <laughs> hey, yeah. out and about, there I said it, <laughs> out and about. Actually, I actually heard there was like an audition process in Hollywood where they came up for people and part of the script they had to read was out and about. And then basically the, uh, the US immigration people were there. And anyone who said it properly, they'd <laughs> back, you know, back across the border. Here, here without a uh, proper permit. Um, so yeah, like I wonder what in jiu-jitsu the outlier thing is. I guess if you start training at a crappy ass club, yeah. that's a random thing. You don't know any better. You don't know that Joe's Shaolin Temple Kung Fu and oh yes, we also do, do grappling. Yeah. Yes, we do this. BJJJ stuff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and several of us, we also train UFC. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Like, or, or, or I was a former Navy SEAL instructor, which is the yeah. trap that I fell into earlier. Oh, really? Time. Yeah. You trained with a former Navy SEAL instructor? Not actually. No, just, weird. Just, just someone who claimed to be. Uh, yeah, that was part of my early journey. And, and I think, again, one of the reasons I'm such an evangelist for quality instruction to people is. Uh, okay. You, no. Jump back, back up. Back 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 up. Okay. Uh, right, yeah, so no, I mean, I think anybody who's grown up in Vancouver has probably dealt with this individual who's told tall tales about living with the Gracies and 
being a Navy SEAL and all that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, okay. um, I didn't realize that we were talking about the same Making doctor. certain proclamations that turn out to be not particularly true, uh, that as somebody who I was fortunate enough to go sexually and, healing teenagers in a hot tub. Uh, for for instance, I never heard that one. I, I think I, I would have had the wisdom to run screaming had I. But uh, yeah, then you know, returning after leaving Vancouver and, and training in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and um, you know, tapping out the 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 invincible master, or sorry, not even tapping out, getting kicked in the head for for not uh, envisioning that a tap was about to occur. Uh, and things like that. Uh, so you guys were wrestling and? And uh, yeah, I, I got an arm bar and then I got kicked in the face. Um, and well, you still have the arm bar? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, so I, I immediately let go and then there was the, I, I tapped and then there's the, well, you happen to be videotaping the training session. I can see that you didn't. Well, you should have known I was going to. Um, so That's yeah. Let, I, that, let that be a lesson to you. Let that be a lesson to me. If you're not psychic, you probably shouldn't be grappling. Psychotic? Uh, <laughs> depending on. Yeah, no, so I mean, I, I think we all have had uh, those sort of early experiences in the martial. I think anybody who does Brazilian Jiu Jitsu that comes from a, a traditional martial arts background has had an experience that led them to realize wait a second, this isn't real. I'm LARPing. Uh, I use the term. LARPing generally to describe traditional martial arts for both if you don't know what LARPing is or if anybody in your audience doesn't know what LARPing is, it stands for live action role playing. <laughs> and these are the guys that dress up in medieval garb and take foam swords into the woods and reenact battles from Game of Thrones or, or what have you. Um, and I'm Although sure some of the SCA guys are actually whacking each other with, with heavy wood, <laughs> which you gotta respect. A absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the majority of traditional martial arts are engaged in LARPing. I had the worst experience last week. Yeah. When I was a kid, like all kids, I wanted to be a ninja. The very first book I bought was Ninja Clan of Death. I was like, talked my mom into buying this for me. Eight years old. So of course, I grew up in the ninja era. So, you know, Stephen K. Hayes. Oh my oh, god. Yeah. The, uh, uh, and then Hatsumi, his teacher. Yeah. These were like gods. And I pretty much would have, I remember hiding in an alley outside a karate school because <laughs> Stephen K. Hayes was teaching that night and I didn't have the money, like it was like a hundred dollars for a three hour seminar. Yeah. It was like, I'm, I'm, I'm like 12 years old. I don't have a hundred bucks, but I can hide it. I wasn't trying to be a ninja. I was just trying to like spy <laughs> through this door. And every once in a while they'd open the door to get some ventilation. And this like 12 year old kid goes sprinting down the alley. Cause he's pretty sure that the ninjas were going to come out and kill him. <laughs> Anyhow. So I'm on YouTube the other night and I'm watching some Stephen K. Hayes videos and I'm watching some Hatsumi videos and it's like, Oh my God, like this is, you know, you punch me. No, 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 not even a, like with one of these lunging punches yeah. with the lead hand. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then, <laughs> or like a sword, sort of like we're going to do side roll. Against sword sword sword. Yeah. Right. But no, you stop here. Yeah. And I pause and I like jump to the side. It's like, it would maybe work against the samurai who had like physical disabilities. And it was the first time he'd ever picked up a sword. And like, if he had followed through, he would cut my leg up like, and it, it was just such a, like, I didn't still, when I watched that last week, I didn't still believe in all this, but it was like, oh my God, I would have given the crown jewels had I had them in my possession. Yeah. You know, 25, 30 years ago when this was my life's ambition to be a ninja. Yeah. I would have given the crown jewels for this. And it's like, it was, it's, it's just such a, such a nice <laughs> reality dose. And you know, let's pick um, something like Seated Guard, Butterfly Guard. Yeah. You can make an argument that it isn't very combative because you're sitting up like this and somebody could punt you in the face. But I guarantee you that somebody who spent 10 years training and competing like this or well, would be way more effective in a street fight than somebody who spent 10 years. years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, with a knuckle strike to the wrist well, and... The, I mean, the, the whole uh, sort of combative argument, I think you and I have this, a similar view of, of sort of the, uh, the laughable nature of a lot of combative training, uh, which is to say, I mean, I think those of us who've gravitated towards, whether it's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or any other aspect of mixed martial arts, where we have a, 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 a combat sport or a combat art that is pressure tested, that is constantly pressure tested, that's just a completely different way of approaching life than 
yeah, all that stuff you guys do is great, but if I take my thumb and jam it in your eye, which takes us back to Shields and Palharis, yes, which then everything you do is now is is is, 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 is null and void. But but here's the thing. So I, and I actually have seen people, some of them facetiously saying, "Well, ha, see, look, I got because in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu community, we laugh at eye gougers, mm -hmm. and and yeah, there are people who are turning up and saying, "Well, but look, this proves that it works." Well, does it really? Because they were in a contest where if Jake Shields had buried his thumb, you know, two knuckles deep in Pajaro's side, he would have been immediately disqualified, and he could have well and truly done so. And, you know, for every guy who pops onto a YouTube comment section and says, well, yeah, I would just, you know, do that. I would kick you in the balls. I would thumb you in the eye. Like, well, I can do those things, too. And I know jiu-jitsu. And you're on and I'm, on, on and I'm going to be on top. Or I'm going to be able to dominate you positionally in a way where if you do something to aggravate me, you know, instead of just politely cross choking you, I'm gonna break your arm, then I'm gonna heel hook you, then I'm gonna stick my thumb in your eye. Like, it's just such a ridiculous argument, and it, I mean, it, but it, it does come from I think the same place that all these traditional martial arts tend to come from, which is the the idea that, and I, I shouldn't say the, the the place that all these traditional martial arts come, t t tend to come from, because that's a little bit dismissive. But I think they attract the sort of people that don't want to do anything real. You know, they don't they want they want to tell people they want to post on Facebook that they're learning how to fight. They want to talk about their martial arts training, but they don't. They are not willing to do the work okay. that it takes. But jujitsu can't be for everybody. This whole. So then, if it's, let's just assume it's for I don't know, pick a percentage, twenty percent of the population. Maybe that's a big number, but whatever. X percentage of the well, population. Uh, what me, should the other percentage do for self defense? If they're still interested in self defense, should they then? Is they is Krav Maga better than nothing? Well, depending on the school, Krav Maga uh, again, unfortunately. As with anything, and this is really unfortunately happening with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, as anything becomes more popular, the standards drop because you are trying to make it appeal to more and more people. So, you know, whereas Krav Maga probably at the beginning was possibly akin to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in the dropout rate, and if you're going to go and do Israeli commando training, not too many people are willing to put up with that. But if you water it down to kicking a guy who's holding a shield in the pretend nuts, 80% of the population can do that, so I think depending on the school you go to, you're either going to get very good training or incredibly poor training in Krav Maga, and then what, what is the difference? I, I think, I had a conversation uh, with, uh, like I've offered uh, free women's self-defense workshops at, at my club, um, and these aren't the like Lloyd Irvin style free women's self-defense workshops, <laughs> where Ouch. they're just trying Ouch. to like SEO their way out of the whole rape scandal. This is like, I just offer free self-defense workshops, because, and the workshops basically say, hey, if you think you're going to go take like a self-defense course once a week, you're like, someone's lying to you. Like, don't, don't take the model mugging course where the guy in the padded suit runs up to you and you scream, no, and poke him in the eye, and then lay down beside him and kick him in the head, because that's ridiculous. You just might as well, might as well just carry 600 bucks around with you and give them to a mugger instead to leave you alone. See, I still think that's a little bit better than nothing. Maybe not for the technique, but maybe the illusion of self, like having self confidence. I took a model mugging course. I'm invinci I'm invincible. I, I'm, I'm also delusional. Yeah, I'm you're talking about the placebo effect. Well, not necessarily. If you're walking down the street with increased confidence, you're yeah. probably going to get attacked less often, or targeted as a victim than if you don't have that. That. That confidence could be based on complete fantasy. Well, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. Um, so I'm saying it's better than nothing, but... Better than nothing, but anything that gives you a bit of confidence, whether it's false confidence. Yeah. So you could, you could play soccer yeah. and carry yourself like an athlete, yeah. and that's going to reduce the odds. You have a really like, good night at the casino. You don't have to go to some guy who's going to teach you a, a load of crap yeah. to, to generate the kind of confidence that's going to prevent you from getting mugged. Uh, or, or reduce your odds of sure. getting mugged, but yeah, the, the, I think the original uh, point was more like the percentage of the population. Yeah, I was, I was talking about the uh, the women's self defense workshop, and w one of the women that came to it said, you know, like I really want to, uh, you know, I'd like you to offer uh, a women's self defense class, and I'm like, well, we kind of do. It's called Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and she's like, yeah, no, 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 but I don't want to do that. I don't want to roll around on the floor with guys. If you could just come around and like I want to learn to defend myself, myself against, against women. Guys. No, no, I want to learn. If you could just do a class with just women in it, and we'll just work on these techniques on each other. And I was like, oh, okay, I understand. You, you want to learn how to defend yourself, but but you're not actually willing to put in the work. 
And she got all offended, and this is again my lack of social aptitude uh, and play here, because I just was like, well, look, I think you really, and I've actually explained this to people, I think you really need to investigate what you mean by the word want. Because want in, in English has you know, kind of two potential meanings. You can use want as a statement of intended action. So like, I want to mow the lawn today. You're usually not describing that as a fantasy. That's, that's a statement of intended action. But if you say, I want to be rich, that's a statement of desire rather than intended action. And I think many people confuse the two. And so they'll say, you know, I want this or I want to do that. And what they really mean is, I would like that if it was provided for me and I didn't have to do anything about it. They're not saying, I want to do that, therefore I'm going to do this, this, and this to make it happen. And okay. I think people who have a breakthrough with that word, with, you know, when you say what, what do you really mean, uh, are you know, the kind of people who are going to find themselves a way to be wealthy or find themselves a way to be good at something or find themselves a way to learn how to protect themselves because if you want to, you can do it. You, just, you do have to roll around on the floor with sweaty guys because those are the people that are going to be assaulting you. And if you're only you got to desensitize yourself. You do. The number, absolutely the do. number one thing of, of jiu-jitsu for self-defense isn't anything to do with technique. The number one thing is to desensitize. We're having a conversation at this range. Yeah. This is a normal conversational range. Yeah. If I was sitting here, yeah. because you're a jiu-jitsu guy. This is not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> but for normal human beings, you go sit somebody that close. Yeah. Is like, for okay. no normal human beings who don't live in Asia, because the personal bubble in Asia sure. is a sure. lot smaller. Sure. In the Tokyo subway. Yeah. <laughs> People don't have to go through the Tokyo subway. Yeah. A, a place where Lloyd Irvin would thrive. We <laughs> should have like a number <laughs> <Okay. of Ding. laughs> <laughs> Stefan told me that if I could make 10 Lloyd Irvin rape references, I get a toaster. <laughs> so. um, you've totally thrown me. Uh, <laughs> right, the number one benefit of Jiu Jitsu for mm -hmm. self defense is desensitization of that range so that your brain, I think, so that yeah. your brain can keep on working. I mean, you've, you've had that experience, sure where you're, some big bodybuilder comes in, mm -hmm. and you're rolling with them and you pin them. Yeah. And then you can just hear them, like completely lose it. Yeah. And like, Ugh! they try their giant bench press. Yeah. And 30 seconds later, they are done. Yeah. And you could do any tech, like pick the stupidest technique you've ever seen on YouTube, and you could do it to this guy, because he's completely done. Yeah. You don't want to be that person. Um, you want to, during the assault situation, you want to keep on thinking, should I be screaming or not screaming? Should I be trying to run or not run? Should I be trying to get that stick? Should I pull my knife or not pull that knife? Yeah. And should I submit or not submit? Like, these are... Well, that is, again, that is what, like, what we love about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I think, is uh, both you and I, is the idea that we can put ourselves into a position of stress where our mind and our body is going to be tested repeatedly. Yeah. And as you say, it's desensitization. You grow accustomed to a feeling of discomfort. You grow accustomed to a feeling of failure and frustration. Uh, and if you're able to work through that, you reap the benefits, not just in your practice of jujitsu, but in the sort of greater aspects of your life. Yeah, I think the, the self-imposed adversity, I mean, historically, many cultures have done this. Oh, you're coming of age in a tribe in Eastern Kenya. All right, we're gonna, um, you're gonna lie down, and we're going to circumcise you without anesthetic. And if you wince, uh, we're going to put a layer of clay across your face. Yeah. If you wince and that clay breaks, you're basically ostracized for the rest of your life. Yeah. So, so what you're suggesting is that I ostracize anybody that doesn't do jujitsu for the rest of my life. I agree. <laughs> done. Oh. All right. Uh, <laughs> um, the, that tribe also, maybe not entirely coincidentally, or that region of, of Kenya, is where those incredible runners come from. So they, it, you know, I think there was a Radio Lab episode that talked about this. I think it was Radio Lab. I'll have to check. But basically, arguing, yes, their genetics, yes, they've got good build for running. Yeah. But there are lots of people in that part of Africa that have got the same kind of build. Mm -hmm. Yes, they walk barefoot to school. Lots of people walk barefoot to school. Yeah. What's the difference? Well, running, if you're running 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers. 42, whatever the marathon thing is, 42 point something kilometers, I think so. you're going to suffer. There's going to be pain. And if you're used to dealing with pain, I'm like, <laughs> I've got my circumcision, my adult circumcision ritual looking forward <laughs> to. Let me learn to deal with pain now early. Yeah. It toughens you. Now, I'd rather not go through that ritual, but I am willing to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. 
the shade, a pale shade of that ritual, though it is. Absolutely, and you know, I've, I've actually heard an analysis of the these sort of extreme races, these tough mudder type events, where they've replaced uh, what used to be a function performed by going to war yeah. in, in our society. Is the people went through a stage of their early life where they were forced to suffer extreme hardship, and we just don't have anything like that in our society anymore. And people actually crave it. And they'll find a, a, a way, of like, you know, back in the day, you'd say, well, man, when we took that, that hill back in Nam, now it's like, man, when I ran up that hill up in Whistler, which is <laughs> not quite as uh, great a story, but you know, don't tell that to anybody who posts about it constantly on Facebook. But, uh, yeah, I think people do actually, on some level, recognize that if, if you've never really worked for anything in your life, if you've never had to suffer frustration or defeat, then... Uh, I mean, you could make the argument that you're incomplete as a person. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the fact that we live in a, a modern, safe society will, will, that will hide that very well. But I think deep down inside, we know it. Mm -hmm. So what are some other examples of people imposing those? Uh, not everybody does. A lot of people are happy to play video games. Yeah, mm -hmm. man, I, <laughs> you should have seen that uh, first-person shooter game. <laughs> right? It's like 12 hours in a row, and it was brutal. Ignoring that. Yeah. I think there has to be a, it has to hurt. Mm -hmm. It has to be difficult, and there has to be a chance of failure, injury, or maybe a perceived threat of death. Like, you're not actually going to die in the Tough Mudder, but you might think that you're going to die. Yeah, I mean, I think if you think you're going to die during the Tough Mudder... Um, Your body might think it's going to die. I, I mean, I haven't done it because, frankly, I, I'm a little dismissive about those kinds of endurance things because I just think that... I, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the, the TV show How I Met Your Mother, but there's a character on there, and, and he basically runs a marathon by saying, well, I don't think it's that hard. I just start running, and then I don't stop. And he does it, and then he ends up on the subway, and his legs seize up, and he's stuck there forever. <laughs> and I kind of like I, I, I kind of have that attitude, like, oh, it's 20 miles? Well, I can do that. I mean, it would suck, but mm -hmm. I know for a fact that I can do it. Whereas with jiu-jitsu, it's like, I don't know for a fact that if I enter a tournament that I'm going to win. I don't know for the fact that if I roll with my ridiculously strong purple belt student who's like choked black belts in competition, I don't know that he's not going to armbar me in front of all of my students and I'm not going to feel like, damn, um, you know, like a gee burning moment. Exactly. So you, I quit. Yeah, you don't know those things. And, and I think that's, I mean, you know, any human being who's not disabled or, or prone to you know exercise induced cardiac arrest can complete a tough mother I mean that's mm -hmm. I wouldn't even characterize it as tough I mean, like mm -hmm. realistically so I, I think those things are different I think those are actually and again people craving something like a sense of achievement without you know and wanting to be able to tell a story about about enduring hardship but it's not the same as like you said the the, the possibility of failure mm -hmm. the possibility of failure and not just the possibility the inevitability, guarantee, yeah. the inevitability of failure that comes with jiu-jitsu is you're, no matter how good you get, you're going to go out there... Marcelo and Garcia has been tapped out in class. Exactly. By, and, you know, and on video for the and world. And on video for the world to see. And I think that is an important part of, uh, of what makes what we do kind of special and kind of unique. Is mm -hmm. that, it, not, not that, I you mean, know, I think it's oversold that, that, it, that Brazilian Jiu Jitsu destroys the ego. I don't think that's necessarily true. I, I actually have a bit to be a lot of people with very lot, healthy egos. Very healthy egos, yeah, because, and, and I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that. I think that this, I mean, first of all, let's look at the term ego if, if we can dive into a little bit of history. I mean, these are Freudian concepts that have been roundly debunked in academia, like in, mm. in science. Like the idea of the id, ego, and superego as being valid concepts for describing the mm. human mind, it, I think passed 50, 60 years ago. Yeah. So for us to use a precept that is not scientifically valid to espouse how great Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is for us, I, just, I don't think is particularly Brazilian good. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is fantastic because it balances the humors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. And when combined with leeching <laughs> and, uh, and trepanning, <laughs> <laughs> a long life of health is ahead of you. No, I think what, what it does is it affords you the opportunity to, like, you know, the, the idea of leaving your ego at the door, I think, is silly. We all have ego, I think. Or, you know, if we, I wouldn't even refer to it, let's, but let's just use the term ego. I don't think that ego is inherently bad. I think that what you choose to focus your ego on is what determines the results you're going to get. So somebody like, uh, whether it's Marcelo Garcia or any other world champion, 
who I'm quite sure what they focus their ego on in one way or another is, I want to get as good at this as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's very different than... I will never tap out. I will never tap out. That's very different than... I am as good as it gets, oh, or okay. I'm, I I'm, the inv I'm invincible now, or I'm never going to be invincible. It's just, <laughs> I am who I am. That's Shaolin Grandmasters and, no, and ninjas and nobody it, else. Exactly, and, and, but I think that is what the martial arts has sold. The idea of an invincible master is, such a, is an idea with such powerful appeal that it causes people to fall down at the suggestion of chi being shot at them by somebody. So it is an idea that obviously has powerful appeal. And I think if, if you invest your ego in something productive, then you're going to have great results. So the kind of, you know, the, the sort of training partner douchebag that we've all experienced at some point, which is the guy who doesn't want to tap, you know, the guy who, the, the white belt seminar teacher, the, all of these guys, they're investing their ego in the wrong thing. Uh, you know, the, the, the person who wants to be, uh, <sighs> let's, just, let's just go easy. Let's just go easy. Ah! <laughs> yeah, that guy, all those guys are investing their ego in the wrong thing. But if you, in, and, and as an instructor, if you invest your ego in being uh, infallible or a source of ultimate knowledge, then I think you're bound to become a pretty shitty instructor. You're, you're, you're bound to become uh, the sort of person that either makes stuff up on the spot or doesn't accept or encourage questions. And then the culture of your academy becomes one of just whatever he says, just you know, agree, don't argue. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the huge, huge tells of a completely screwed up school, if there's if there's a culture of no questions. Well, I you know what early on when I opened my uh, academy, uh, I had a few students from another school transfer, you know, all the the top guys from one school transferred over to my school, and I was teaching something, and one of the students put up their hand and said, "I don't mean to question you, but," and right away I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa okay, we, let everybody, let's stop the class right now. This is something that we need because this was like a week into my my school, but existing, I think." It was like, we need to settle this right here. Don't anybody ever have that idea of, I don't mean to question you, because that is, it, like I said, that is the death knell yeah. of a legitimate place. And Either it's true, and you're afraid to, you know, you don't actually want to, or you're lying. Or you're lying. Yeah. And either way, neither, I, neither of them are good. I always tell, like, the, the only things that I teach in my academy are things that I know very well, I've studied extensively, that I use myself, or that, you know, black belt world champions use themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I kind of have a, a filter and a formula for what is good jujitsu, and uh, I'm only comfortable teaching what I'm good at and understand relatively deeply. And if I can't explain to you exactly why we're doing it, why we're not doing it a different way, what person used this to achieve what ends, then I shouldn't be teaching that technique. And not only not only should I not be teaching, if you don't feel comfortable asking questions, you shouldn't be paying me to teach you. Yeah. If you think that I'm the kind of guy whose uh, ego is gonna suffer from you asking me why we're doing this or doing that, then I, I don't belong as an instructor. Years ago, I came from a very traditional kung fu background. Do not question the head instructor. Mm -hmm. He can't spar with any of the students. He would kill them. Yeah. He, he'd like he wouldn't mean to, but he just he would he automatically. Would, he wouldn't mean to. But he would just automatically kill them. And I started training with Makoto Kabayama, who was a. Um, <laughs> I met him in a martial arts store, and uh, the guy called, "Oh, you're interested in, in Bruce Lee and Jacob JKD? That guy's a JKD instructor." So I go up to him, I, I introduce myself, and he's like a little, uh, you know, Asian dude. I go, hi, my name's Stefan. He goes, oh, my name's Nip. I'm like, pardon me? He <laughs> goes, hi, I'm Nip. I'm like, how do you spell that? He's like, N-I-P. It's like, okay. <laughs> now, his real name was Makoto <laughs> Kabayama, that was his nickname. And uh, like in one of the first classes, he's like, look, ask me anything you want. Yeah. If I know the answer, I'll tell you. If I don't know the answer, We'll figure it out. Yeah. And that was like, holy shit. Like, somebody, a martial arts teacher, admitting that he might not know what the answer is. Yeah. This coming from a traditional Kung Fu background was like, I mean, of course I knew those guys didn't know the answer to everything. Yeah. But, but, but you would never, they would never admit that. And you yeah. could never ask, you could never bring that up. It's yeah. like, you know, <laughs> the emperor had no clothes and you were invested in, if you didn't want to be kicked out of the school or ostracized and never shown anything ever, you know, Showing the next three moves in the Tiger Crane sequence or whatever, yeah. then you wouldn't ask that question. So it just then then that kind of sent me down the whole JKD path, where there is a much more casual approach. You know, you met Dan Inosanto at the time; everyone called him Dan. Like, yeah, that's a first name basis. Mm -hmm. You know, it, um, 
and uh, you know, it's changing in jiu-jitsu. I actually don't like the whole professor. You know, people come up to me and call me professor. I'm like, my name's Stefan. They call me, you know, sir. I'm like, that's my dad's. You know. Yeah. Mom. I mean, it's a title, and and, and, I, and I realize they're trying to be. I realize they're trying to be. This is just a personal preference. No, and I, I agree with it because I have the same thing with my students. You know, what do I call you? Well, whichever version of Robert makes you happy. Yeah. You know, like. I, See, I, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with it. I don't feel comfortable with it. Yeah. So, my name's Stefan. Please call me that. But I think once you start layering, like you see Professor more and more and more, and I kind of understand where it's coming from. Yeah. But on the other hand, it also sets up this whole cultish mentality. Could like, agree more. We've got a special name for you now. Yeah. And, you know, it's just one step further along the, okay, the next thing is, you know, you're, uh, I don't know. You're going to give me your credit card, I'm going to charge you an amount of money, I'm not going to tell you what the dues are. Yeah. Eventually we're like firstborn children, you know, firstborn children have to be handed over. Well, there is an element of this in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu that does exist, is the, the sort of cultish element, which I mean, I think will, will, will inevitably arise in any group, where human beings are tribal uh, to, to some degree or another, and uh, you're going to invest in your tribe. Uh, and I think that the, you know, the more responsible uh, school owners or, or, or teachers do a good job of dissuading that and, and making sure to kind of undercut that. Um, but a lot of them don't. Uh, and frankly, the ones well, they that benefit are, from it. Well, the, the ones that are less legitimate tend to encourage it far more. They're discouraging people from training at other places or uh, that sort of thing is a is a very common thing. Amongst Thou shalt them. not watch YouTube. Yeah. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think and and I agree with you about the the title thing. I, I think that uh, you know. Power is, you know, the, with a great power comes great responsibility. Um, if you <laughs> give a philosopher, Peter Parker. Peter Parker, yeah. But, no, that, was, know, that was his aunt. That was his un uncle, I think. Uncle? Yeah, depending on which version oh. you, you, you which, uh, reboot. which reboot you watched, yeah. But, you know, as, I mean, we're two guys in pajamas with, like, colored sashes around our waist. We shouldn't have great power. You know, <laughs> I, no, we were like, really. I, like, I, had, um, I had this conversation with a couple students recently after class, where I was like, all I'm qualified to tell you about in life, really, is how to better strangle people. Mm -hmm. You know, I can make, I can give you some advice about achieving goals. Yeah. I can give you some advice about dedication to a craft. I can give you some advice about you some not really bad physiotherapy advice. Yeah, and I can, and I can Ooh, give you some. Look good. Well, and I can give you some really good advice about um, creating a life for yourself uh, outside, off the beaten path. That, you know, like, I don't have a 9-to-5 job. I've never really had a 9-to-5 job. I'm extremely fortunate in that. And, and I've been able to to live a life that uh, is just extremely, uh, I hesitate to use the term blessed, but it is kind of blessed. Uh, and that's been through the generosity of my family and my friends and just meeting the right people and uh, and and also sacrifice I did because I, I wouldn't even call them sacrifices but just giving up certain things there are certain things that I've never pursued in life because I've thought that uh, living a life that's dedicated to a, a, a craft is has a, a greater reward than living a life that's you know pursuing keeping up with the Joneses and that sort of thing so I can give people advice on Man that who walks through all open doors uh, yeah walks into the but really wall. what else, why would you come to me for advice on anything else I can teach you how to you know not have a nine to five or I can tell you how to potentially not have a nine to five job and still make a living I can tell you about how to get fit and get good at jujitsu I can tell you what really good ways are to strangle people um, why would you come? Why would you invest me with any other power than that? Mm -hmm. just, and certainly, why would you invest me with the power to tell you where you can spend any of your time outside of the school? That's ridiculous. Mm. And is the, the source of this kind of cult thing? Yeah. Is people being uh, granted power? People, authority is uh, another word. We talked about the word "want" having two meanings. You know, authority can also be a word that has two meanings. Somebody is in a position of authority. You know, for instance, a police officer is uh, somebody who's been given authority by fiat, by decree. And then you have somebody who is an authority on something. I'm an authority on strangling people. Mm -hmm. I am not somebody who has authority over you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important distinction for people to also make. I have a certain amount of expertise in a field, and that's really all you're coming to me for. And to, Taking it anywhere beyond that, you're going to, you might get lucky, you might get an instructor who really is, you know, a wonderful Zen master 
uh, and who can give you important life lessons on everything from how to get the best mortgage rate to you know how to recover from a breakup to you know what position to use to impregnate your wife what, what have you but for the most part it's just blind luck yeah. you're, you're talking to a guy who's very good at or who's, who's hopefully very good at, uh, well, at a particular don't, skill don't, and, yeah. and, and that's another thing as a beginner you won't even know as a beginner if you walk into you know Joe's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Academy and you know, there's a, a blue or a purple belt teaching there. A blue or a purple belt, even a shitty blue or a purple belt, is basically Thor to the average untrained person. So you can't even tell if that guy's any good or not. Now, after you've trained there for a year and all of a sudden you're competitive with him, then you might realize what's up. But by that point, you've been training there for a year, you're, you're friends with everybody, you're invested, and you know, so the, 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 the the circumstances are ripe within uh, any sort of group endeavor any that, that, that has any bonding element to it for cultish elements and either the guys at the top have to really watch out for it or you as a consumer have to really be self-aware i was about to say this this is unique to the martial arts because people don't go to uh donald trump and ask him for relationship advice <laughs> but then again dr phil did have the best-selling diet book in north america for a while so, so i give up yeah uh, it, uh, they're, <laughs> the, you know, the, I guess the bottom line is that there are there's a segment of the population that is looking very very deeply for answers and for abdication of responsibility, mm -hmm. and they will find it whether they find it in church or whether they find it at their martial arts club or they find it at the local bar. Uh, there are there is a segment of the population that's going to always look out for yeah. them because now it's not on them. Exactly, now, their success or failure. Yeah, especially their failure. Yeah. You know, we're getting totally off topic, but it's my, it's my we, podcast. We were supposed to talk about jujitsu, oh, right? and we will. Yeah. And we will. Um, have you followed this dad bod meme, meme that's going I've, on? I've heard it? about it. I, it's I, like why girls prefer guys with dad bod. Like, yeah. You know, like, yeah, he works out once in a while, but he drinks beer and pizza, and he's got a bit of a gut on him. Yeah. And it's like, you know, well, it doesn't put as much pressure on us, and, you know, uh, what was the other... Yeah, uh, yeah pressure. Pressure uh, is, is a late motif of my life, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I want to be the cute one. I don't want him to upstage me. Real, I mean, really, it's like permission. It's 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 an abdication. I think here's Stephen Kessing's take on dad bod. Yeah, you know, it's it's a permission for women. Women who <laughs> tread lightly, <laughs> Stephen. <laughs> women are happy with a guy who's got dad bod. Yeah, want permission. Want to be able to abdicate any responsibility for their own physical condition? Couldn't agree more. So there. Yeah. Oh my God, this video is going to get flamed, and it's going to be yep. all your. Yep. And, and, and my my small circle of detractors <laughs> is going to have more evidence of what a colossal asshole I am that they can present to their five students <laughs> to tell them why not to go to my club. Okay. Well, perfect. I'm glad it's 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 not win win for us, but it's, it's win win. win someone's win, win. winning. Yeah, there are people yeah. winning in this conversation. All right, Rob. So tell me about your jiu-jitsu. Honestly, right? okay. You have an unusual path to your Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Yes, yes, absolutely. Right. So, where did you start? Well, after you started the, with Navy SEALs. I started with Navy SEALs, uh, purported, reputed Navy SEALs, uh, and then I uh, started. Actually, my first Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor was Omar Salvosa, okay. who was a um, a brown belt at the time, and I would do private classes with him. And I trained at a couple of different places. I was training pretty much for MMA uh, and self-defense and stuff like that. So I was ex pretty much exclusively training in Nogi. Uh, and in, I think, 2004, I made a trip down to Florida. Uh, a friend of mine at the time who, again, uh, I've been exceedingly fortunate in, you know, we're talking about the book Outliers where people kind of stumble into circumstance that sets them on a path to achieving right. something. Uh, and so really I was fortunate enough to uh, stumble ass backwards into friendships with people who happened to support my desire to live a unusual lifestyle that didn't involve a nine to five job. Uh, and try to get good at jiu-jitsu. I'm glad you qualified what unusual lifestyle meant, because I could have gone <laughs> you, yeah, in yeah. entirely different I, direction. I, I, yeah, so I, as I said, I've been fortunate to not have to have a real job and be able to pursue the study of jiu-jitsu and martial arts in, in general. Uh, and part of that is again, generosity from my family, uh, my mom and uh, my deceased father, who through whom I, I, I 
came across some money. Uh, and between that and a little bit of lucky investing and working as a bouncer and, and, and teaching, you know, like the, the, the first martial art that I took was, it was called combat jiu-jitsu and I was able to teach classes in that a little bit to support myself. So I've never had to have a real job. Uh, and this friend of mine happened to relocate, who uh, I was um, living with in, in Toronto, he happened to relocate to Florida. And he invited me down, hey, come down. You know, you, you think the jiu-jitsu is good where you're at now, you got to see it down here. Um, where was he training? He was, at the time he was training uh, with a guy named Josh Manzo, who was a brown belt under Pablo Popovich. Okay. Uh, and so I, I went down there and I trained with Josh. And, you know, again, it was like, it was another level. And, yeah, not like a crazy another level, but just, uh, you know, uh, at, at the time, you know, in the early 2000s, there weren't a lot of high level guys in mm -hmm. Canada. Um, and particularly for me, because I was always a guy who tried to do things differently, uh, you know, the idea of just going and training in the gi at a regular Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school wasn't something that I was looking for. I was much more interested in training no gi, uh, and that didn't, you know, there weren't no gi schools. So like I would do private classes with Omar where we would just train no gi and then I would go to his club on open mat days and, and roll with everybody. Uh, and so I started going down to Florida and on my second trip to Florida, I was uh, fortunate enough to meet Charles McCarthy who would become my coach. Uh, and I trained with Charles uh, not long after being, again, fortunate enough to have an opportunity to do several hours of private training with a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world champion. And upon meeting Charles, I learned more from him. He was a purple belt at the time under Laborio. And he taught me more in half an hour than this Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu world champion did in several hours. Uh, and that's not to diminish this, this, this champion, it's just you know, language barrier, uh, lack of um, understanding of pedagogy. These are all things that I think are, and it led to you know, my, my, my stance or position or, or on, on developing Jiu-Jitsu athletes or students is you know, a high-level athlete, a high-level champion might be incredible, and what he does, but doesn't have the ability to convey information. Sure. How good uh, a boxing instructor would Mike Tyson? Would be? Mike Tyson be exactly? So the you know meeting Charles and one of the reasons it was so um, propitious uh, that I met Charles is that at the time I had heavily developed my leg lock game, and I was absolutely rubbish at everything else. I couldn't pass the guard to save my life. I had no guard retention skills. I didn't have anything that would resemble what I would now characterize as real grappling skill, what I had is a bunch of wacky submissions from weird places that a lot of guys hadn't seen. And so I could, at the time, legitimately walk into most Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu clubs I trained, I would go to, and I could still tap out, you know, instructors, purple belts, brown belts, even black belts, with heel hooks, with like weird kimuras from odd places. And I mean, these guys would run the table on me otherwise. They would pass my guard, they would mount me, they would do whatever, but it was no gi and I was, you know, young and athletic and quick and I was hard to put away and, you know, a guy would dominate me for 10 minutes and then I would catch him in a heel hook and be like, I'm a pretty awesome grappler, I don't really need to learn. This stuff that you guys are doing where you pass the guard, gay, you know, as a young guy, uh, that's just, I just did not have the, the foresight or the wisdom to, to recognize the, the flaws in my process. And meeting Charles was a boon because he was a leg lock guy and so I would try all my leg lock stuff on him. <laughs> that's nice. Pass, arm bar. Uh, and so I was forced to face the limitations of my game, uh, which if I hadn't met him, I could have spent two, three, four more years just you know rolling with guys and heel hooking them and thinking that that made me some kind of savant, which yeah. it probably would have. <laughs> the idiot <laughs> part. Uh, and then, which is why I, I encourage uh, you know, my students so much like I, I teach leg locks. I teach, you know, right now we're doing a heel hook module at my school, but I'm always telling the guys like, if, if you think you're going to build a game off of this, dude, it's, it's, it's the same as building a game off of absolutely not understanding leg locks. No. You're, you're going to run into a guy who can defend leg locks and then he's going to beat the crap out of you with everything else. So that was a, a really fortunate thing. And then uh, over time, I was able to start spending more and more time visiting and then. Right around, I guess, I think it's 2009, I started really focusing on uh, training in the gi. And so uh, all this time you've been focusing no gi? Focusing no gi, yeah. And then. Uh, so why on earth would you switch to the gi? Well, two reasons. One is I did want to become, like, not just a guy who you know, taught a few classes out of his basement so that he wouldn't have to have a real job, but I wanted to be a legitimate instructor. Um, and, the, you know, the way that. Charles and a couple other people could put it, put it like, how are you going to advertise yourself as a guy who's pretty good at no gi? Like, 
what is your credential going to be like are you going to be like black shirt yeah black, black shirt like uh, so I was like well I'm, I mean I guess I could go to Eddie Bravo and cut him a check and but then I'll have to do the lotus position which is the only way that you can prove that you can be a black belt is and, and I can't quite do it so I guess that was out I have a little you know old injury here that prevents me from being able to stretch my hip out quite all the way um, so a weakness of character I, I, totally totally uh, the um, so the process was you know you, you got to get your black belt in jiu-jitsu and if you want to get your black belt in jiu-jitsu you got to start training in the gi so it was something that I did kind of begrudgingly to be honest because I had spent a, a few years uh, uh, you know, drinking the the Eddie Bravo Kool Aid about the, the the uselessness of the gi, and that was kind of a blind alley. And so when I started training in the gi, um, I did notice the benefits of it for uh, for certain things. Although I'm still not one of those guys, because I don't any more than I agree with someone like Eddie Bravo who says no, 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 gi is useless. I don't agree with the guys who are like, oh. Gi is like, that's the only way to go. No gi is less technical, it's this, it's that. Um, you know, the, the, the claim that's often made is that it's very easy to transition from gi to no gi. It's really hard to transition from no gi to gi. I didn't find that to be the case. Really? Um, yeah. I, I, I Even being a leg lock guy, which is Being a leg lock guy and lock. being a no gi guy, um, the reason I believe it's difficult for most people to uh, transition from no gi to gi is you're having to learn a whole bunch of new techniques and the process of learning jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, is tends to be presented to you as a process of you're going to learn techniques. Here's the, week one, you're going to learn how to do an armbar from the guard, you're going to learn how to do a triangle from the guard, you're going to learn how to do an upa escape, you're going to learn all these techniques and then eventually when you get enough techniques, here's your blue belt and then you're going to learn some purple belt techniques and oh by the way, most of those moves we taught you at white belt, yeah, those don't really work so great. You gotta learn these new ones that now they work against blue belts. And now you got some more techniques, here's your purple belt. And oh by the way, these techniques that really work at blue belt, they don't work so well anymore. Here's some techniques. That, and that was kind of the process. So because you're faced with this with this daunting prospect now of, oh man, I gotta learn like a thousand gi chokes, and I gotta learn this and I gotta learn that. It's impossible. It's just it's too much material right off the bat, and because you've learned a bunch of no gi techniques that depend on you know gripping here instead of gripping here, mm -hmm. now you're like, man, these techniques that I know they don't work. I gotta learn all these new techniques. I don't know what to do, and I didn't really have that approach. I was fortunate enough around the time that I started focusing on the gi, both to see my coach narrowing down his process. He had gone through this, this Charles, Charles, yeah, he had gone through this process of reducing the amount of techniques that he employed, whether it was in the gi or no gi. He basically said like, anything that takes me any unnecessary effort, I'm trying to get rid of it. And so seeing him go through that and just start. So for, can you give an example? Like what did he? Well, at a certain point he just stopped going for arm triangles. Okay. He's just, he's like, I just find it's too, doesn't quite work. He even reduced the amount, he was a, like, he was a Kimura specialist even. And he started even going for that a little bit less. Uh, and just, just in general, anything that he found that, was, uh, that he felt was too much effort, he's like, I'm getting rid of that for my, my game, I'm getting rid of that for my game. It's at the same time, I was being exposed to Ryan Hall's instructional material and his way of conveying jiu-jitsu as being a set of principles. Yeah, it's very conceptual. Very conceptual, and it spoke to the way that my mind works. Everything I'd always done uh, while I was learning, I would try to understand through a conceptual lens. I just didn't have the framework for it at the time. So as much as I might be a physics nerd or a science nerd, and I would try to categorize things, I wasn't using the right categories. And this led me towards the right categories. So when I made the transition from training mostly gi to training, or sorry, training mostly no gi to training mostly gi, I just tried to systematize everything. And that led to one, Ignoring blind alleys, uh, although there were still a few, but mostly being able to ignore blind alleys and focus largely on the the body mechanics of what I was doing, and just understanding points of control rather than this is technique 570 of how to wrap someone's lapel around them. I just have to create rotational control. I have to create lever-based control. I have to uh, use either direct control or proxy control. All these terms that uh, I've since tried to you know, basically create a system out of, and when I say a system, like, you know, I, I wouldn't characterize what I teach as a system of jujitsu in the same way that people will say, oh, this is 10th planet jujitsu, and this is, 
uh, you know, uh, whatever, Atos Jiu Jitsu, because it's constantly changing. I, I, I've tried to, at my academy, basically rip off the best guys in the world. What, what do the best guys at, at each particular skill that I happen to be teaching, what do they do? Can you How, give some concrete examples? Like, just the guys who... Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I know you recently did a, a podcast with Bernardo Faria. So, yeah. he is pretty much the best guy, or if not the best, maybe between him and Murillo Santana, sure. as the best over-under passers in the game. So It's hard to deny that these past, like, you know, won a world championship. Exactly. Actually, and then, you know, if, if you're looking for, for the De La Hiva guard, you're looking at the Mendez brothers. If you're looking for the inverted guard, you're looking at Ryan Hall or the 50-50 guard. If you're looking for butterfly guard, you're looking for Marcelo Garcia. So anything, any particular skill or specialty, I would try to just study the crap out of it, learn how they do it, train with them if I could. I was fortunate enough to spend a little bit of time training with Marcelo, a little bit of time training with Ryan Hall. I've recently been able to train with Kai Otera. Uh, I'm heading back there again. Uh, I've tried to seek out the, the best guys and get a chance to, again, either study their instructional material or study with them personally and create a system, not again, a system of jujitsu techniques, but a system for learning jiu-jitsu and a system of uh, fundamental movements that comprise jiu-jitsu. So once you understand the fundamental movements, you can create a, a, a personal expression of jiu-jitsu that suits your body type, that suits your personality. So once you understand the laws of physics and civil engineering, you can build any kind of structure. You can build you anything you want, exactly. And it won't fall down, hopefully. No, no. And I mean, I, I, the, there's a, an interview out there with John Danaher, who's another sort of personal, uh, uh, I, I guess, hero of mine in, as far as instruction goes, uh, where he says he's a dictator on the basics. And I would characterize myself the same way. When I teach, uh, if, you're, if your foot is you know, a little bit wrong for base, I'm going to yell at you. Not yell at you like you're a piece of shit, but like, hey man, you, you the guy who shows up once every two weeks, I don't care, you do it right. You know, and so I, I try to make sure that people do the fundamental movements that uh, create proper body alignment correctly. And then after that, you want to be a deep, half, a deep half guy, be a deep half guy. You want to be a De La Hiva guy, go nuts. If you want to go for flying submissions, go nuts. But if you're the guy who's winning every blue belt tournament with flying submissions... Good luck doing that at Purple, Brown, yeah, Black. Yeah, you, you, you could. could. You know, a lot of those guys, uh, you know, are the guy, and, and I mean any, and I know I'm going off on a diff different tangent, but any guy who is basically a professional jiu-jitsu competitor at Purple Belt is going to be able to do flying triangles on some guys, and, and that guy might just be awesome. But there's also the guys that are pulling off, you know, wacky, some, or being the only guy who's good at footlocks in a small geographic region and showing up to local tournaments and footlocking rubes, you know, doesn't make you good at jiu-jitsu. Uh, it means that you're, oh, as long as you stay in your small pond, you're never going to go no. beyond that. But that, yeah, you that's, are that's a big a fish in a small pond. That's a separate tangent. But uh, yeah, so I, because I was able to create concrete systems for developing these movements, I feel like I was able to make the transition to gi relatively easily. And for instance, uh, is something I don't know whether I should admit, my first time competing in the gi was at Black Belt. And I was fortunate to be able to win gold in my first. So, uh, you know, tournament. How long did it take you once you started training with a gi to make it to black belt? Um, well, depending on how you want to define it. Uh, seriously, once you seriously start training. Seriously, um, I'd say about two years, two to three years. Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't the first time you put on the gi. No, no, but it was the first time I really devoted myself to, yeah, like, so I went from purple to brown impressive. to black very quickly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's really been, I've been doing a bit of training with you and it's, you know, to watch how you deconstruct the basic <laughs> I want to say basic. Fundamental is so much a yeah. better word. Yeah. Fundamental um, principles of movement, and then like, okay, well, here's the principle, and now let's apply it a hundred different ways or ten different ways. Yeah. To like, you know, stop somebody from passing your guard, right? You know, if he's at this range, here are your options. And if he's at this range, here are your other set of options. I found that really useful. It um, and it it uh, provides a context to then take a look at what all these. I mean. There are always the freaks out there, right? The, yeah. the meows who are so flexible that, you know, put both their feet behind well, their Well, feet. that's, yeah, we were talking oh, about that earlier. Sleep. I think there is uh, something that... They're attribute-based game. Yeah, that's exactly what we call it, an attribute-based game. And that, that's something that I think people don't really, people who don't think deeply about jiu-jitsu aren't offered the opportunity to view it through this lens. It's like, why is that guy really good? You know, why can't I just do what he does? Well, you know... For one, are you an, an autistic kid who trains eight hours a day? Well, there's your answer why you can't do what he does. 
Two, do you have the physical capability of putting both your legs behind your head? If you can't, then you can't do what he does. And I think it's important for those of us who are like, you know, I'm not having a guard where both your legs have to go behind your own yeah. head is great. Yeah, you can do that. But it's like having a mount escape system based on being able to bench, bench press, press four, that's 400 pounds. That's absolutely right. And I think that great for the guys who can do it. Right. So for for somebody who you know, as as an instructor, at some point you have to choose. Yeah, uh, or you know, pick your battles, or choose what you're going to focus on. And I think so what I've tried to focus on as a coach is creating a system for the, the more average person to be able to uh, achieve or mirror the sort of skills that a high-level practitioner uh, achieves. With you know, whereas a high-level practitioner, you know, world champion and an elite-level competitor might achieve these skills just by default. If you, if you put 10 years into getting good at something, there's certain things you're going to pick up along the way, there's certain things you're going to develop along the way. You're going to get your 10,000 hours. You're going to get your 10,000 hours in and you're going to be an expert at so many things that some of them are going to be the crucial things. Uh, and I think that what I've stumbled upon and, and tried to develop, again, largely you know, there's that old saying, you know, if, if I see far, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. So by taking ideas from Ryan Hall, by taking ideas from John Danaher, or Damian Meyer, from my coach Charles McCarthy, uh, from trying to uh, model what the, the best thinkers, the best practitioners are doing, and trying to distill it into, again, an underlying system for what are the movements, what are the, um, uh, what are the physical principles that you should be following, I think I've done a good job of creating a system where a more average person can, let's say, speed up the process. Mm -hmm. uh, by how much, I don't know. But again, like I said before, I've had you know, a, quite a few students be very successful in competition. I've had students that have won pans at Purple just, just today. Yeah, there you uh, go. Uh, we were at a tournament earlier, and that's uh, I, what we're doing this interview on the tail end of. And I had a couple of students win gold in very impressive fashion. My Purple Belt, uh, he won gold with... Uh, you know, three matches ending by submission. Yeah, there was nobody that didn't, didn't submit. Yeah, and so uh, you know, I've, I've I've got a system, and that system works very well for athletes as well. Like if you're an athlete and you're not having to put ten thousand hours in and, and go down blind alleys, and that's why my purple belt Shane is so good, is because and this is a guy who has is a high level athlete, has uh, achieved success uh, in other fields like swimming and hockey and things like that. And so when you take somebody like that, and he has the uh, the analytical approach to learning and the willingness to uh, to follow the formula because the formula that I use is different. It's mm -hmm. not what you're used to. You know, my classes are different, my seminars are different, though the way that I teach is a little bit different. And I know, for example, I've got an affiliate club uh, in Ontario, and, and the, the guy who runs it there, he has asked me in the past, he's like, how do you get your students to do you know, the amount of drilling or, the, or, or, or do the kind of stuff that, that you uh, espouse? And I'm like, what do you mean, how? I, I tell them to do it and they do it. Again, because they follow a certain formula, they're able to achieve quicker results. And again, going back to my, uh, my affiliate club in Ontario, you know, the, the guy who runs it just came down here and I, I put down a bunch of material for him on a video of our modules and what to follow. And you know, two, three weeks later, he sends me an email. He's like, you know, I got a student here that's gotten better at guard retention in the last two weeks since we started working on this material than he got in the last two years training at a major, very well-known, high-level competition school and at my club for the past six months. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not that I'm showing, he's like, it's not, it was not a single movement that he didn't already know. It was just the system. No. It's understanding the principle and knowing when to do it. I'm not saying that high-level guys can't benefit from your material, because they probably can, but I think they're already high-level for a reason. Exactly. So it's, it's almost like you know, accelerating people through that white, blue, low purple stage. Absolutely. That, you, know, you can learn it the easy way or you can learn it the hard yeah. way. Yeah. Well, like I have a student, for instance, who, so like we have a visiting student program at, at our club. Uh, and the visiting student program is one of the ways that I try to pay forward the ridiculous amount of generosity that my life has uh, that I've received from. in my life, that I've benefited from. Uh, like I said, whether it's friends, whether it's uh, coaches, whether it's uh, above all else, my mom, Barbara, hey mom, um, is, who, like, is responsible more than any other person for my success in life uh, because of her generosity, because of her support, and because of her willingness to understand that yeah, you know, her son might be good as a lawyer or a doctor because he certainly can yammer away crap, 
but no, that's no, not. I, I can't see it. Yeah, I can't see it. but that's not what he wants out of life. And if he can fill a, a niche that, that helps other people with something that I completely don't understand, you know, I mean, I'm, I don't think she saw me do jujitsu for for many years and was still willing to support me mm -hmm. doing it. Um, and so anyway, I, I try to pay that forward with this visiting student program, uh, where anybody from anywhere who wants to come and train with us, come and visit for a week or two, uh, is welcome to do so for free. You know, I have a spare room in my place. I got it for the express reason of hosting people who come through town. So I've had visiting students come from Eastern Canada. We've had guys come up from the States. Uh, and they, you know, again, f follow this formula and, and find that it's uniquely successful for them. Uh, and these are guys who have had opportunities to train at other clubs, again, very high level clubs. And what they find is, yeah, the guys at those high level competitor clubs that are coming in and putting in, you know, the four hours a day and all that, those guys get really good. But if you're not one of the chosen competitors or if you're not the guy who's putting in all these hours to, to gain all these these skills, then your road is harder. Yeah. Uh, and well, so certainly there are, I mean, a lot of clubs, they really just cherry pick the guys who are most likely to medal. Yeah. And, and somehow the instructor's ego is completely tied up with how many medals their guys produce, and especially the Brazilians, mm -hmm. the team trophy is, is a big is, thing. Is yeah. a big thing, yeah. and uh, you know if you're, it's worth you know fist fights and arguments and. Well, and you know, I mean, I, I can't say that I'm above that. I know one <laughs> of no one of my proudest achievements uh, as a as a coach has been the couple of times where we've sent a skeleton crew to a tournament and ended up you know top three four in the team trophy you know we, we did a tournament in Seattle a couple of years ago the Washington State Grappling Championships and I think and we were the smallest team there and we placed top three in gi and no gi and we were the only club to be in the top three in both gi and no gi mm -hmm. uh, and that was uh, you know an achievement for me and uh, I think it spoke to the results that we created as an academy as a young academy we'd only been a club for a, a less than a year mm -hmm. at the time uh, so uh, I'm proud of things like that, but you know, if you win a team trophy because you've got eight jillion competitors, yeah. that's not the same as you know. It, I, to me, if you're going to give out a team that, trophy, that's Mr. Bean being excited about a Christmas card arriving when he's put the Christmas card stuffing, in the door yeah. for himself. So if you don't stuff the ballot, if you have, if you decide the team trophy based on you know the ratio of competitors relative to the size of your school that medals, that would be a far more just way of doing it. Uh, but, but then, then people would just, then cherry, people pick. Would just cherry pick and then yeah. send their five best killers. So Which is what used to happen back in the old days in Brazil. I remember Marcus Suarez, my main Brazilian Jiu Jitsu coach, talking about the yes, there were the big competitions, but the fiercest competitions were in the academy for the spots. The guys for the spots, because they could only send so many guys. Yeah, yeah. So there'd be guys like ripping each other's heads off to get those spots. I, I, I've, I've heard of this, uh, you know, with like the, you know, the A team for certain competition teams because they get a favorable draw and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, there's definitely, I mean, that's stuff that I try to really stay away from. Like I said, I am proud of the fact that as a small club, we have been able to show up to tournaments and be in the top five while having the smallest amount of competitors. But uh, like really, I, I think that competition is not, for one, it's not what we focus on. That's something that I think some people, especially in our community, uh, one, one of the criticism that, that's leveled on me by uh, uh, certain, let's say, uh, instructors on the island is that, oh, they're a hardcore competition club. No, we're not. It's ridiculous. We show up and we goof around and we try to get good at jiu-jitsu by playing games. Uh, we don't focus on competition at all. We're not a competition club. I don't have guys coming in like, all right, guys, here's how you're going to get two points and you're, we're going to guard pull and we're going to use this strategy. I just teach my students to get good at jiu-jitsu. We, we very much follow the idea that uh, I believe Faraz Zahabi uh, of TriStar has this term called universal jiu-jitsu, which is your jiu-jitsu should work in MMA, it should work in gi, it should work in no gi, it should work for self-defense. If that's not true, then you're not really doing jiu-jitsu, you're doing an expression of a rule set of jiu-jitsu, and I don't believe that at all. I think there, you know, we've had students succeed at gi, succeed at no gi, uh, and if, you know, for instance, we've had students succeed very well at no gi, despite the fact that for large periods of time, we train only gi. We've had, uh, you know, if you watch the tournament uh, today, uh, for the last month, Shane and myself have been training exclusively no gi. He put on a gi once mm -hmm. before doing this tournament, and if you understand jiu-jitsu on a fundamental principle level, it shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. So we're not a hardcore competition club. We're just guys who try to get good at jiu-jitsu. Uh, and I think that's, uh, again, the, the results speak for themselves, whether it's the guys who never compete and you know people come in and visit our club from, 
from wherever, like, wow, man, all your guys are killers. Like, oh, I mean, they're, we focus on getting good at jiu-jitsu. They, they should be good. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the, <laughs> it's nice that it's quantifiable, right? Like, you can do, uh, you know, imaginary, what was it, live action role play? LARPing, yeah. <laughs> LARPing for a long, long time and be, you know, think that you're pretty damn good at a uh, five finger exploding, five finger exploding heart palm, palm technique. technique. There we go. <laughs> but in Jiu Jitsu, it's fairly quantifiable. Like you can arm bar this guy or he can arm bar you. It's, or you can you know, you know, pass this guy and dominate him positionally or he can pass your guard and dominate you positionally. And it's yeah. it's very quantifiable. You, it's you, very quantifiable. And, and you drop I mean, out for a month, you get injured for a while, you come back, and you're getting murdered. You, yeah. it's, it's not, you know. And that's why, you know, I think Salo Hibero has this saying, which is, jiu-jitsu is made for you to quit. And it's, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it is. because like, I've never heard that before. Yeah, he says, jiu-jitsu is designed for you to quit. Because, like you said, you take a month off, you come back. Oh, man, these guys are way better than me. Well, I guess it's time for me to stop going. Hmm. Yeah, they're... You know, there's a saying I think, which is, you know, in life you can find a reason to do something, you can find reasons not to do something, and how much success you have is going to be decided by which one of those paths you choose to take. Do I always decide not to do something, or do I find reasons to do it? Uh, and jujitsu will constantly challenge you to do that. It'll challenge you to give up because a guy you thought you were better than beat you, or it'll challenge you to give up because you're a 200-pound man and a 140-pound woman beat you and all that kind of personalization stuff. And I know we talked a little bit about ego, and one of the things I really try to convey to my students is, you don't win, you don't lose, jiu-jitsu always wins. The person who expresses jiu-jitsu more purely, more technically, is just channeling jiu-jitsu in the better way. So it was the technique, it was the approach that won. If you want the approach to win, be the person who shows up and is able to express the technique more correctly and then you can temporarily, you know, cling to that victory inside the club. Which again, who cares? Uh, but yeah, I, th I think uh, there, there definitely is that aspect of quantifiability. But the flip side of that is, I think sometimes we can be, uh, and I hope you don't mind if I go on another tangent here, but we can be oh, victims. Tangents are right. Uh, yeah, um, we can be victims to the like uh, the, the idea of testability and say, well, okay, I couldn't armbar that guy, therefore the armbar doesn't work. Right. Okay, well, are you a 140-pound guy and is that guy a 220-pound steroid guy? <laughs> you couldn't armbar. No kidding. He can bicep curl your entire body weight. Yeah. And that's why it goes back to separating attributes from the pure technique of jiu-jitsu and really trying to learn jiu-jitsu for the sake of expressing proper technique and not winning. And maybe it wasn't your day and maybe it was his day you or maybe you got lucky. Mental or... slip, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's it's such an elusive art, you know. It, uh, it is, and it I, made, I just think that's you to quit. That's my new, uh, that's my new thing. Yeah, and I just think it's important because sometimes people, will, you know, like I'll I'll remark on a technique and say that's not a very good technique. Well, well, I saw so and so do that in so and so tournament. Like, well, yeah, I mean, you you also see like you can see Rafa Mendez show up at a local tournament in Tokyo every year because his sponsors send him there and dance around hobbyist yeah. black belts and do crazy techniques like look Rafa Mendes did that I'm gonna work on that flying reverse lapel choke this week man come on that that's that's not legit that that's somebody you know that 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 that's that's Michael Jordan coming in and playing a pickup basketball game with guys who play on the weekends yes he can exactly. he can do whatever he wants to them that doesn't make it a valid way to play the game or or again to take the piss out on Irving Cabados oh I saw this work once well anything can work on a drunk Yes. Yeah. It's like well, you can knock a drunk out with you know a slap. You can knock a drunk out with a punch. You can knock a drunk out with your ox hand. Well, and uh, this is one of my favorite things about the current uh, you know schism in jujitsu between sport jujitsu and self defense okay. jujitsu. This whole idea that the, you know a guy who is able to barambolo somebody at, at the purple belt level at a tournament is not going to be able to handle some drunk. We got to work on headlock defense. Come on! Before I knew anything about jujitsu, I had taken on four people in a bar fight and choked them all out because I knew an arm drag and a rear naked choke. And I always say, if you know an arm drag and a rear naked choke, that is 95% of what you need to know for self defense. Uh, you know, you don't need to know headlock defense. You know, I'm not saying you shouldn't learn it, obviously, but this idea that up until you get your blue belt, you got to be working on haymakers and headlock defense. You're going to become a crappy grappler. And anybody with any grappling skill whatsoever, anyone who can do a double leg and an arm drag and any basic grappling technique is more than equipped to 
perform well in a self-defense scenario. Yeah. And again, I would argue that the technique is a secondary thing. The primary thing is that... The skill in controlling a human body and the stress response. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I mean, which is really the single best argument for competition as a self-defense training thing because the adrenaline rush of being there in front of your peers and your instructor and hundreds of spectators. I, I couldn't agree more and it's amazing to me that the the self-defense... So, you know, so even if your game plan is to pull inverted guard, yeah, doesn't matter because you're pulling inverted guard under stress. In, under stress. Yeah. Well, and that's amazing to me that the, the guys who will you know, promote this urban combative style and they say, well, you know, you practice under this rule set and you train under this rule set and therefore in a street fight it's in a different rule set and you're not going to be used to it. Well, what do you train under? You train under fantasy land rules where we're not actually resisting. So the fact that you practice eye gouging doesn't matter because you're not practicing under real stress. So I, I just, I get with there's John, a lot of the, deeply was, flawed logic out there in both the urban community, but even in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu community. I think it was John Donaher's point, but I'm not sure exactly where it comes from, but it's 100% true that Jigoro Kano's genius, mm -hmm. the founder of Judo, you know, they had all these systems of Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, which were sort of the urban combatants of their day, like, yeah. okay, neck break followed by, you know, sucking the guy's eyeball out <laughs> and then fighting off the optical nerve, yeah, or whatever, you know, like, punching to the 12th spleen meridian, yeah. Um, he took out all the deadly, the deadliest techniques. The, the deadliest, yeah. Well, no, they are deadly. Yeah, no, you can make enough. an objective argument that the eye gouge is a deadlier technique than the armbar. But if you and I are training the eye gouge at full force, okay, after we turn the camera off, we're gonna, we're gonna, yeah. we're gonna eye gouge at full force. I'm really gonna be trying to eye gouge you. You're yeah. really gonna be trying to eye gouge me. It's gonna be a short training session. And we're never going to train again. And we're never going to train again. Yeah. Or maybe one of us will. Yeah. <laughs> but really, I mean, the odds of, you know... The more proficient gouger will eventually become the Miyamoto Musashi of <laughs> eye gouging. <laughs> but as a, as a sustainable training method, you're much... So Kano's essential genius was saying, better that we get really good at applying the, quote, less deadly techniques, the throws where you're not dropping the guy directly on top of his head. Mm -hmm. Well, they go to judo tournament, you see lots of guys getting thrown directly on top of their head. Yeah. Not that, notwithstanding. That you're producing a much more effective grappler, martial artist, by training the less deadly techniques than you would by practicing the more deadly techniques in fantasy land. Oh, yeah. well, absolutely. And I think, uh, I mean, genius is a good word for it, but I, you know, when, you, when you sit down and just think about what you've just said, there could be no other way. There's no way that you could get so good at eye gouging. There's just no way that you could get so good at eye gouging that it could become a replicable skill under the stress of combat. You just can't. So anything that is a replicable... If you had a lot of convicts. If, yeah. If you had a room. Okay, in, in modern society or in anything <laughs> resembling a, you know, a modern just society, uh, there's Not no that I've thought about this. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm going to admit to having thought about That's where that door leads. <laughs> I was wondering... <laughs> right. Need a place to stack the bar. <laughs> so yeah, in, you know, in any you know, conceivable modern circumstance, there is no way that you could get so good at these purportedly deadly skills that you could become proficient at it uh, for rep replicability in combat under stress. Yeah. And if you're efficient at applying semi-deadly techniques in combat under stress or fake combat, then there's a chance that you're actually going to retain enough of your executive function to go, oh yeah, I could also I eye out. Whereas if you're like, what? like uh, your, your, your fine motor skill is going to be Shot to hell. I bet you that if you told Hafa Mendes, okay, listen, at the end of this match, I want you to eye gouge this guy. Yeah. He'd be able to do it. No problem. Yes. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. High level skill uh, in any combative sport is just so, again, the average person just doesn't understand, I think, what the levels of ability are. You know, again, I mentioned earlier, the average guy walks into a gym and let's say there's a, let's say there's a blue belt who's a fraud and he's wearing a black belt. As the average guy on the street, there's no way you could tell. Mm -hmm. You would not be able to tell. Uh, any remotely legit blue belt should be able to do whatever he wants to you. So to, to you, wow, if someone's better than that guy, yeah, not only is someone better than that guy. They're ten they're, times. They're ten times better than that times. guy. And the guy that's ten times, twenty times better than that guy, there's another guy who is ten or twenty times better than that guy. And people don't realize just how deeply it, it, it scales up. It's uh, too depressing to think about it. I'm just going to go back to eye gouging. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right, I'm gonna go uh, rebuild my eye gouging dummy that I thought about building as a child. But, uh, and I'm gonna go learn some more words. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Rob. No, it's my pleasure. Great chat. Thank you.